Welcome to the 33rd episode of Two Tankers and a Cat. We're your host, I'm Charlie. And this is Russell. 33 episodes. 33 episodes. And, and now we're into 2020. 2020? Yeah. Hey, can you see any better? I still can't see oh, any better. Oh, you... I swear. I, I get older and older. Uh, supposed to be the year for your eyesight. Yeah, I know. Hey, I can tell you about April. It's 420 all, all, all month long. All month long. Oh, <laughs> man. Only you. Yeah, uh, 420 it means something to other people. So we Charlie won't. says he wants to move to Colorado, I think. <laughs> I want to retire in Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> we, we won't get into that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, announcements, you know, happy new year. Happy new year, everybody. And hope you're ringing in good. And this should be coming out January the 7th, right? Yeah. This should be our January 7th episode. You know, that's my beautiful daughter's Brittany's birthday. All right. So happy birthday to Brittany. Where's she at now? Who knows? Yeah. You know, she's a flight attendant. She flies all over the world and you know, she's done, you know, a little, uh, Patreon, videos for you know uh you know different tank museums and stuff like that yeah, yeah. um she she is so sweet <laughs> if we ask her hey can you swing by you know a bovington or you can swing by there you, you know uh, we might have her just be a two tankers ambassador because we have there all we these go. friends yeah. in different countries and yeah. stuff so if we uh, get a note from you and we're like, hey, you know uh, my daughter's gonna be there why don't you swing by and have lunch on us yeah that'd be a good yeah. thing for our Patreon users. Sure. So, um, okay. Uh, today's episode, we're going to be talking about the M1-128 Striker. And what else are we talking about? What's our second point? And our second point, we're going to be talking about 73 Easting, which was the last great tank battle of the 20th century. Now, that was Desert Storm, right? Desert Storm. Okay, because I know you've done an, epi- an episode on uh, one of the tank battles that happened. Yeah. Um. Let me ask you this. Um, do you remember when we first saw the uh, M1-128 Striker? Yeah, I do. It was a Fort Benning. That was pretty sweet. Yeah. If you pull on the base. and Yeah. Uh, me and him had seen this tank rolling down at, at Fort Benning, uh, and it was surrounded by unmarked Army security cars. And, uh, Russ, tell us about this most powerful U.S. wheeled M1-128 Striker. Yeah, the M1128 Striker mobile gun system, which is also a mobile artillery system Striker, is an eight-wheeled infantry support vehicle equipped with a 105-millimeter tank gun. <laughs> I'll take that. Oh, I know. <laughs> it's based on the LAV-3 Canadian, which itself is based on the Moag Piranha. And is in service with the armed forces of the United States. Now, this Moag per, uh, Piranha uh, is a family of fighting armor vehicles designed by the Swiss company Moag. And there's like five generations of vehicles there. And we're going to have to probably talk about that in a later episode. Yeah. But yeah, the Canadians were using that uh, kind of based on that uh, the LAV uh, 3 can- Canadian. Uh, just give us some details about the striker. The mobile gun system's low profile turret has a small silhouette, is stabilized, and mounts a 105 millimeter M68A2 rifled cannon with an auto loader. I want I want a lot of information about the oh, auto, I know. auto loader cannon. Auto loader 105 millimeter. Wow. The vehicle is primarily outfitted to support infantry combat operations. While it could take on some of the roles of tanks, it is not designed to engage in combat with tanks. The MGS can store 18 rounds of main gun ammunition, 8 in the autoloader's carousel, and an additional 10 in a replenisher located at the rear of the vehicle. It has a rate of fire of about 6 rounds per minute. So not a lot of ammunition, but it's probably not meant to, you know, be no, that. No, no, uh-uh. I'm sure they've got some resupply vehicles pretty close anyway. Oh, I'm sure. The MGS's 105 millimeter cannon can fire four types of ammunition. The M900 kinetic energy penetrator to destroy armored vehicles. Like tanks. The M456A2 high explosive anti-tank round to destroy thin-skinned vehicles. 
and also to provide anti-personnel fragmentation. Nice. The M393A3 high-explosive plastic round to destroy bunkers, machine gun and sniper positions, and to create openings and walls for infantry to access. Now, we call that breaching. Breaching, <laughs> yes. Yeah, when, yeah me and uh, Russ have done some special we- weapons and tactics or SWAT training, and uh, one of the things was the breaching walls and yeah. breaching doors and stuff yeah. like that. Um, of course, we were we we could never use the 105 <laughs> millimeter. <laughs> okay, so tell us about the last round. Yeah, the last round that they carried was the M1040 canister shot for use against dismounted infantry in the open. Whoa. So if they got infantry ch- charging, they're going to fire the old canister shot. Wow. <laughs> wow. Because the vehicle was originally designed without air conditioning, crews were given individual cooling vests that circulate cooled water from outside the vehicle to the garment. Vehicle computers still overheated regularly, though. Okay, so that's a negative. That to be a negative. Well, was it amphibious? No, the vehicle was not amphibious. So, okay, that's that's a problem. Yeah, well, that is All true. Right. All right, this aren't, isn't starting out so good. Go I ahead. I know. The large weapon station and relatively smaller hatch can make emergency exits difficult. And because the main cannon is separated from the crew compartment, it is possible for the crew of an MGS to encounter a stoppage in the heat of battle and not be able to clear it without disembarking from the vehicle. Oh, now wait a minute. Wow. So the hatches are tough to get out if the tank's on fire. You know, we always use the Chieftain for World of Tanks. Mm-hmm. If you haven't seen any of the YouTube videos of uh, the Chieftain doing that stuff, he, he basically gets in a tank and then he tries to get out. And he's a big boy. Yeah. He's, he's tall. Yeah, tall. He's like, oh, bugger. The tank's on fire. <laughs> and uh, so if you get a chance, it's actually really fun yeah. and informative. So these guys are having all sorts of trouble getting out. And if the gun jams, they have to get out of the vehicle and risk sniper fire and everything wow. else. I, I know we're supposed to, you know, say, yay, the great know, vehicle. But, um, but, you know, I've also talked to somebody that was in the military at one point in time saying that they had to be careful about the directions that they would turn the turret because... Mm-hmm. At the beginning, they had issues with it actually turning over when it, whenever it would fire. <laughs> okay. Yeah, with it being off balance. Yeah, all MGS striker platforms have since been upgraded with air conditioning units. Okay. So they so fixed that problem. <laughs> there are some negatives to this tank, and, and this goes again proving if you're building a high-tech computer tank, Add air conditioning. Add air conditioning. <laughs> Don't tell them it's for crew <laughs> comfort. Just tell them it's stabilizing. To all the future tankers, you know, if we have yeah. a you know designer, put AC in your computer tanks and to say nope, it's not for the crew. It's to cool the you know cool the equipment. There we and, go. And we're gonna have tankers all over the world going. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> the Striker mobile gun system has a tumultuous history. In the years after Desert Storm. The Army concluded that its light airborne forces were quick reacting, but lacked fire firepower. I agree with that. You know, uh, like your paratroopers mm-hmm. and stuff like that? Okay. By contrast, armored and mechanized units with their heavy tanks and fighting vehicles possessed the firepower the paratroopers lacked. But owing to their sheer mass and complexity, the heavy units could take weeks to deploy to a war zone. They're, they're bringing in special forces. They're bringing in paratroopers. They're like, listen, we're needing you know if a tank shows up we're needing something to knock it out but we're needing something quick and can go down the roads and uh, okay so give us an idea of who designed this thing the army wanted forces that combined some of the airborne troops nimbleness with elements of the armored forces fighting strength and the result is the striker the general dynamics built striker weighs just 20 tons compared to 70 tons for the M1 tank. Okay. But the reduced weight comes at a cost. The $5 million a piece strikers have thinner armor and smaller weapons than a tank. 
Five million bucks for one five of these Five million things. bucks a piece, man. It, and again, no that's wonder why they had security around this thing. To no, <laughs> no wonder why, <laughs> why we're trying to get in contact with yeah. the politicians of the United States. Like, you know what? Five million bucks, and we could take it down to Fort Benning and tell Rob he's got a five million dollar yeah, budget. I know he could finally get some of the artifacts that yeah. we have. I know, and get them undercover and get them cleaned up, maybe yeah. even restored running operation. Yeah. I'm on my soapbox again. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, hey, Go ahead. That's the way it goes. The most heavily armed striker is the mobile gun system with its 105 millimeter cannon, and the M1 packs a 120 millimeter main gun. It, you know, the M1's got 120, but this striker with the anti tank gun, yeah. the 105, it's still yeah. able still to kill. pretty powerful. So give us an idea of what this striker gun could kill pretty easy. Yeah, the Stryker MGS was never meant to be a tank like the M1, but it could find itself doing battle with enemy tanks. The primary weapon system is designed to be effective against a range of threats up to the T-62 tanks. The Russian T-62 dates to the 1960s. Uh, You know, the T-62A is in the historical tank game of world tanks and, and i think you that was your i've got first, it yeah that's my first tier 10 first tier 10 they made it uh, so it could smoke older tanks so this striker like we're talking about they they're going to go to certain countries and we're not trying to say anything negative no but some of these countries have older model soviet era tanks yeah that's their main yeah. battle tanks that they use yeah so, and if you look at the wars today, uh, and like we were saying, it's armored with a lot of Soviet. So the planners are like, we're going to be going to these places, and if we do run into Soviet armor, yeah, this is what we're, or you know, their enemy armor. This is what we're probably going to be looking at. Sure. Okay, Russ, get to the stats. Yeah, the striker has a crew of three: a commander, a gunner, and a driver. It weighs. About 18.7 tons, has a hull length of about 7 meters, a width of 2.7 meters, and a height of 2.9 meters. So pretty compact. Now, I know we've talked about the gun, but I love hearing about this gun. Give me more about this gun. Yeah, the 105mm M62A2 is a rifled autoloader cannon with full solution fire control. It has two axis stabilization, so the vehicle can fire accurately. While on the move. So this thing can be rolling down the road, see, you know, enemy, you know, armor and and fire and hit dead on. Yeah. That's just like the M1. Yeah. Well, what kind of other guns did it have? Yeah, it had a couple machine guns. It had one 12.7 millimeter machine gun and one 7.62 millimeter machine gun. And we've said that the 105's maximum fire rate is, what, six rounds a minute? Six rounds per minute. Well, what about, like, depression and elevation? Yeah, the depression was about negative 10, and the elevation was about positive 18 degrees. Wow. So, how about its traverse? It had a traverse range of 360 degrees. So, it can spin all the way around. Full turret, yeah. Nice. All the way around. Uh, as, and you said the full ammunition loadout was 18 rounds. 18 rounds is what they carried on board. Uh, how much, uh, ammunition did it carry for the machine guns? Yeah. It had 400 rounds for the 12 point millimeter machine gun and about 3,400 rounds of the 7.62. So when it needs a heavy machine gun, it's going to be firing about 400 rounds. Yeah. Yeah. And for the, you know, protection of against infantry or whatever, uh, 7.62, it's got 3,400 rounds. 3,400. What kind of engine power are we talking about? It had a Caterpillar 3126 diesel engine, which cranked out about 350 horsepower. Oh, <laughs> so it's got a shabby. little bit of oomph. It has a maximum road speed of about 100 kilometers per hour, which is about 60 miles per hour. And it has a range of about 530 kilometers. So on the 50 meter dash, you know, from, you know, this flat stop and you know, flooring it to the floor. Uh, how many seconds for the 50 meter dash? About nine seconds. <laughs> Not so, shabby. So it goes a hundred kilometers an hour or 60 miles per hour and does a nine second 50 meter dash. Nice. Yeah. Well, what kind of range is this thing? It has a cruising range of about 330 miles. 
with a fuel capacity of, of about 53 gallons. Wow. So it's actually pretty good on gas. It is. Um, what's their, I guess, the survivability? What kind of special things does it have on the skin to make it survive? Yeah, the actual armor on the thing. It has a high hard steel structure, a Mexus ceramic layer, a Kevlar spall liner, and IBD passive RPG add-on. It's got ceramic. Ceramic. It's got Kevlar inside, you know, because we were talking like like in the Japanese tanks mm-hmm. and when it got hit, yeah, it yeah. splinter, you know, metal inside. So the Kevlar stops that. And it's got the IBD passive RPG add-on. It's for when somebody shoots an RPG at yeah. it and it won't pin it. All right. It's got a combat weight of about 41,300 pounds. Or the transport weight, no ammunition or anything inside it, about 38,000 pounds. Gotcha. All right, cool. You know, they basically grabbed an artillery piece, let, let's be honest, or, or anti-tank gun, and set it on the striker. Now, we've, we there's like a whole bunch of strikers, but uh, how many variants of the striker is there? Uh, we've And we've heard some negatives about the tank. Tell us some positives. Yeah. The MGS is one of 10 variants of the Striker series of wheeled armored vehicles. In 2013, there were 27 of these fire support vehicles per Striker Brigade. Armor of the mobile gun system protects against small arms fire and artillery shell splinters. The interior is lined with the Kevlar spall liner, and the vehicle can be fitted with add-on composite armor, which provides protection against 14.5 millimeter rounds. And add-on slat armor, which protects against RPG rockets. The MGS is fitted with the MBC protection and automatic fire suppression systems. So if the thing catches fire, you know, like, like we've talked yeah. about, yeah. like, oh, oh, we're on fire, it, it actually sure does its own system of fire control. The engine and transmission of the MGS can be removed and reinstalled in less than an hour. So, oh man, what an improvement over the uh, every, Sherman. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, actually, it's kind of like the Sherman, you know, yeah, they pull yeah. the transmissions pull out it and go. The, the army's thinking, hey, we're going to be using this for quick fire, you know, and yeah. quick support. And, and if we blow the engine or the transmission, we can pop them out and redo them all in an yeah, hour. In an hour. That's amazing. It really is. The M1128 can be airlifted by a C 130 Hercules. And larger military transport aircraft. The M1128 MGS rolls out of the C-130 aircraft in combat-ready status. They can transport this fully with combat, you know, ready. Sure. And pop right out. That that that's actually a really good it idea. Is. So it they is. have fixed the you know air conditioning ish, issue yeah, yeah. for the crew, so they can be a little bit more comfortable. They fixed, you know, like I said, they see fix the computer problems. They got a fire su- suppression system because if it did catch fire, it's going to be fighting the fire so the guys can get out even though they're having a little trouble for it. Wow. It, and it can be transported on a C-130. That's yeah, awesome. That is. Um, well, I guess we get to our second point. We've mentioned Desert Storm, and that leads to us to this second point. Uh, tell us a little bit about 73 Easting. Iraqi Army General Salah Mahmoud commanded a division in the Republican Guard. At the time of the battle, he controlled the 10th Armored Division, the 12th Armored Division, the 52nd Armored Division, the 18th Mechanized Brigade, and the 37th Armored Brigade. Well, at that time, Iraq had the fourth largest army in the world. He's got... Like we were talking about, he's got Soviet era tanks and that's what he's got, but he's got control over this Republican guard, which, you know, was their elite. These aren't, you know, conscripts that were given up in droves. These are the guys that are like, no, we're trained. We're, we're fed. We're ready to rock. On the U S side, Colonel Don Holder, the second armored cavalry regiment commander, was ordered to locate the enemy and to avoid becoming decisively engaged. The regiment had its three armored cavalry squadrons operating on the front line with an aviation, 
which was the attack helicopter squadron in support. All right. So that makes sense. Yeah. But, you know, it always, in every history thing, you know, they have, they're ordered, don't become engaged. You know, you guys are basically scouting. You're out there. Yeah. And also to note, the second ACR had 36 M1A1 tanks. Uh, among all, all the other vehicles. Yeah. I know they had Bradleys and yeah. Hummers and everything else. The weather was rainy, which was not a problem for the U.S. thermal sites. And GPS allowed them to go through the desert and not on the main roads, which would be important because Iraq had pointed their guns at the roads expecting the U.S. to come that way. This Saheed, the, the Iraqi commander, is like, okay, I, I've, got, I've got the armor. You know, we put out some anti-tank or anti-aircraft guns. We're waiting for, you know, helicopters or anything like that. But I want everything pointed down the road. Because they know they're not going to come in through the desert, especially in the rain. Yeah, exactly. Little did they know. (laughs) (laughs) All Iraqi units occupied well-constructed defense emplacements and had prepared alternate positions, which enabled them to reorient. So he's done everything that he... uh, These are actually Soviet Union uh, military armored tactics. You know, you want to, you know, hold down, uh, you know, these little... Things they they dig down, they yeah. drive the tank down to where the just the hole is, and if they did get pushed too hard, they had another spot they could drive to, to you know, help them continue the attack or defense. The majority of the Iraq armored vehicles were old Soviet era type vehicles. The primary tanks used by the Iraqis were the model T fifty five, T sixty two, and T seventy twos. The main battle troop carrier was the BMP one. And each of these vehicles has a manual form of targeting, which is far slower to operate than that of the Abrams and the Bradleys. Also, the optics on the American vehicles didn't necessarily need a clear line of sight to engage. In these 1960s, 70s type tanks, like we were discussing, it's raining and they're looking down the road and everybody's focused for, you know, them coming down the road. And they're having to use manual sites where they, you know, have to look yeah. through. And our stuff, like the Bradley's tow missiles, they all they got to do is computerized and automatic, man. Yeah, even the Abrams, they don't yeah. need a clear no. line of sight. No. Well, what happened? The second ARC engaged the enemy, and the third armored division was ordered to their location, three hundred kilometers away, to support the second. And upon arrival, the 3rd Armored Division engaged in full-scale tank battles for the first time since World War II. Now, we're being very, very brief on this battle because there are so many different little engagements that have happened. Again, yeah. like we've always said, we need you to go and look up yes, these yes. amazing stories, to research it. And don't get us wrong, too. We'll cover more in the future, uh, well, in well, future the, podcasts. Absolutely. Yes. But if you want to know more... Yeah. You, you need to get up and, and do your yeah. own research. Yeah. And uh, if you have a particular battle. Yeah. In Desert Storm. And we're hoping you get let it. Let us know. Yeah. And we will we'll cover it, man. Yeah. And if you were a tanker during yeah. this, you yeah. give us a call. Oh, we yeah. want to talk to you. Get, basically, they, you know, we talked about both sides, what they had. Tell us about the casualty and losses. On the Iraqi side, they had 600 to 1,000 killed and wounded, 1,300 plus prisoners taken, 160 tanks destroyed, 180 personnel carriers destroyed, and they also had 12 artillery pieces taken out and 80 wheeled vehicles. And they also had several anti-aircraft artillery systems that were taken out. So I want to go back through their losses. They had 600 killed, 1,000 wounded. They took 1,300 prisoners, but all those tanks we were the T55 and the T the other ones they've lost 160 tanks and i think we said the second had what 36 or something yeah. at abrams yeah and they lost 180 personnel carriers and they had these artillery pieces dug in to support their armored the 12 of those got destroyed they lost 80 wheeled vehicles and their anti-aircraft systems they had set up for the helicopters, they had several of those, and they got wiped out. So what was the American losses? The Americans had at least six soldiers killed and at least 19 wounded, and they lost one Bradley fighting vehicle from enemy fire. 
Okay, so that was kind of a lopsided battle. Yeah, that was. Uh, but there goes to prove what we've always said. Technology. Technology. Will defeat the manual over every time. That's right. The best, the country with the best technology is going to win yes. the future wars. 100%. Yeah, I mean, this guy, a uh, hero, basically a hero general yeah. from the Iran Iraq war, got promoted. They gave him command of a Republican guard. He had all these divisions, all this armor and everything, and 36 tanks. Yeah. And, the th- and of course, the third came yeah. in. We had more than that. But some helicopters and stuff like that. Yeah devastated them yeah. and we had six killed 19 wounded and we lost one bradley vehicle now i know we took some other hits from the abrams uh because i've actually I, I actually know a couple of tankers that were in that battle and they were like uh, no we got hit they just couldn't pin our armor yeah, just couldn't pin it and yeah. that counts as damage yeah. to there so yeah. people will say wait a minute they lost a lot more or there was a lot more american tanks damage if you hit the tank and blow off its fender, you know, that little sheet metal yeah, fender on yeah, the front, yeah. that counts as damage. So what an amazing thing. Well, let's get to our Patreon shout-outs. Yeah, we want to shout-out to Andy Crow. Thank you, Andy. And Warren Ben, still with us. Good. And Christy McCarty. You know what? Um, I really enjoy my time with Christy. She good. is a great girl. Good, good. And then Kevin Shin. He's he's just one of the best guys. He's one of my world of tank guys too. Sweet, uh, Kyle Montgomery, Mark Drake, and who else? ODS Thero. And we can't forget Rick Schmidt. Rick Schmidt. Rick, we're hoping you have uh, a great New Year, yeah, brother. Yeah, yeah. Have if a you, great twenty twenty. If you want to get in our shout outs, join our Patreon. Please do. It's yes. just a yes. lousy two bucks. Yeah. You know, let's face it. You can get on Patreon. The easiest thing to do is just get on Patreon.com and search for the Two Tankers and Cat podcast. Yeah. And it'll come up. And I, I mean, and you'll be able to have access to our extra content and all that good stuff. And you're, you're helping us out so you are, much. You are. And, and we look forward to bringing you guys so much more. Yeah. We've already done a year. You know, I know there's a lot of people that have been holding out saying, well, I really don't want to support you guys. Yeah. If you're only going to do one. Well, no, we're on what? Yeah. Episode 33. Yeah. This is episode 33 and we're still plugging away. Yeah. And we're starting our second year. Yeah. So we're here. And we're excited to bring you guys many, many more episodes. And we want you to know, we're not spending the money on, you know, buying no, socks. No, no, This is for the equipment. Yeah, and the equipment the, to come up with to, to bring you some pretty dang cool interviews eventually. Yep. Yeah. We're, I mean, that's basically what's yeah. stopping our interviewing stuff. Yeah. The recording equipment that we need, yeah. for, you know, for Skype and stuff for like that. For everything on the road and Skype. Yeah. Yeah. Everything. We're, we're going to need to do that. And if you've been holding out, don't hold out anymore. No. It's only a couple of bucks, and yeah. it, you know, couple we'll, bucks, couple yeah. bucks a month, and we'll shout means a lot. And we'll shout, shout your name out and yeah. say how cool you are. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, I guess that's the end of the show, uh, Russ. Uh, I hope you have a great new year and everything yeah. going. I hope everybody listening does. I hope it's a great year this year. Well, this is Charlie, and this is Russell. As always, happy tanking. And have a great week.